Good afternoon. I'm Per Peterson, and I'm delighted to be able to welcome Dr. Daniel Rasky uh, to today's View from the Top series talk. I would also like to thank our Berkeley student chapter of the American Nuclear Society. Can, can, they're, they're actually working, unlike, <laughs> unlike the rest of us. Uh, for co-sponsoring today's lecture, I'm also honored to welcome the alumni and members of the Engineering Dean Society who are joining us today as well. And we're welcoming students who are attending from the Newton Lecture Series. And uh, for, for you, there's a sign-in sheet that you should sign once, once the talk is done on your way out. It'll be available for you at that point because you, you, you need to do that, right? And what I'd like to do is to, to explain why I'm so enthusiastic about today's talk and so honored to introduce our speaker. I had the chance to meet Dan actually about two years ago at a, a British consulate science event. We, I, I've been a closet fan of SpaceX and company, and companies like that for a long time, as anybody who gets my emails knows. <laughs> And so he is the co-founder and current chief of NASA's Space Portal Office, which was established in 2005 to promote the development of the new space economy. And he's no stranger to bringing disruptive innovation to the aerospace industry. Earlier today, we were asking Dan for advice on how to expand that across other fields of human endeavor, including advanced reactor development. And we've had a very, very good discussion so in 2006, Dan was awarded the Exceptional Achievement Medal for promoting, for promoting and developing partnerships with emerging and non-traditional space industries in order to progress the commercial development of space for the benefit of NASA and the country. He is an internationally recognized ex expert on space thermal protection and entry systems. He was the primary inventor or major contributor to flight hardware on seven NASA flight systems from the space shuttle to the Mars Pathfinder, to the Mars Exploration Rover Spirit, and the Opportunity, and the Stardust Space Probe. You just can't get more cool than that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his inventions include the thermal protection systems that enabled Stardust's return mission, the fastest ballistic entry of a man-made object into the Earth's atmosphere in history. Now let's hear from Dan Rasky as he tells us more about lessons learned from disrupting the civilian space and aerospace industry. Let's, let's, thank you very much, and thank you for your time and attendance. There is a reception that follows, okay, if you, for, for, for those of you who didn't know. And yes, yeah, so I want to give you a little bit of a, a, my perspective on disrupting the uh, civilian aerospace industry. And one of the first things I want to do is introduce you a little bit to my world. And you mentioned Stardust. So let me show you something. Hopefully, I can get this to go the way I want it to. Five, four, three, two, one. Pleiades, rapid brightening. As descent sees it, your near spec is acquired. We see it. 70 degrees aft. Above Mars. Hey, Katie. Oh, that's cool. Foresight. <laughs> Quite a trail. Near spec has a great view. Air plasma lines have been detected. Molecular emission over there. HDTV, you got a strong weight. Go get it. Oh, we got that, boys. <laughs> That was actually the, uh, the actual entry of Stardust in January of uh, 2006. And as uh, per mentioned, that's the fastest entry ever 
of a man-made object at Earth. It was a little under 13 kilometers a second, so that's faster than Apollo. Uh, peak deceleration was 35 Gs. So if you were on that mission, you'd be flat as a pancake. And uh, the part that we're particularly proud of, in addition that it, it worked, um, and by the way, the mission was to go out to a comet, deal to get samples of that comet, and come all the way back to Earth. It launched in February of uh, 1999 and came back in 2006. So it was seven years in space, because it's a long ways to get to a comet and come back. And but one of the keys is that our heat shield, Pika here, enabled the mission. So the, without our peaky heat shield, there wouldn't have been a stardust. And so now it's in the Smithsonian. We're very pleased with that. My daughter got to get a picture with, Dad, I got a picture with your Pika heat shield. So I was pleased with that. Anyhow, so we're, we're quite pleased with that accomplishment. But we're not the only one who saw that. Um, there's this guy, Elon, uh, who also was interested in doing things in deep space going to Mars. And so he saw the stardust heard about the Stardust return and success, and that's the heat shield he wanted for his Dragon capsule because he wants to go to Mars, and because he's a physicist, he knows about planetary mechanics, and he knows if you can come back from a comet, you can probably use that same heat shield to come back from Mars, and he's right. So that's the heat shield that is on the Dragon capsule, that's Pika, and that's the C1, that's the first capsule that, that uh, Elon flew. Um, and I can probably say my fingerprints are all over that. Because <laughs> I actually worked at SpaceX for a year to do the tech transfer of Pika to SpaceX. Stood up a, stood up a, a lab to make Pika and worked on getting the, that heat shield together. This is the Dragon version two, which he intends to carry people in and eventually to Mars. So, uh, uh, and that's a, a shot of the, of the uh, uh, the shop area at SpaceX. So they have that C1 capsule hanging from the ceiling, which I've always wondered about the safety aspects of that, but anyhow, but they, <laughs> they got around that. And so it's always nice to see. But what I want to do now is, is walk you back a little bit in time. Okay, what kind of led up to um, SpaceX and Elon? And some of the things that I saw going through my career at NASA which have, I think, a number of parallels to the nuclear power industry in particular. I mean, I'll, I'll let, you, let you be the judges of that, but I'll, I'll show you what I saw. Um, I first came to NASA and, uh, in the late 80s, and the first thing I worked on was a national aerospace plane. Some of you may remember that, the Orient Express that President Reagan announced. And <clears throat> I had heard all the, the public press on, Na on the NASP program, they called it NASP, um, before coming to NASA, uh, they, there were a lot of pictures like this, okay, showing NASA flying through the sky. It was intended to be a single stage to orbit, uh, fully reusable vehicle. And so I came into NASA, and I remember went to the first um, technical um, um, review and quarterly on NASP and uh, was just very surprised because I quickly came to the conclusion there were four miracles required for that vehicle to fly and what was going on because surely the people, the engineers there knew that, you know, it took many miracles. And we used to joke that God is never so kind. Okay, maybe one or two, but not four. <laughs> well, similarly at the same time I got to work on the Mars Pathfinder. Actually, this was the first uh, planetary probe that was flying one of my heat shields. And so we started working on this and that was an exceptional experience working with JPL putting that mission together, a Sojourner, a little Sojourner rover. Um, I had a, a Mars shirt I would wear around um, at the time, and people would come up to me and ask me how Sojourner was doing. You know, they, they really bonded with, that, um, bonded with that mission, and it worked out very well. I also had a chance to work on something called generic hypersonics, and this was actually kind of a follow-on to the National Aerospace Plane program when they realized how many miracles were needed so, okay, let's take them one at a time. And so this is actually a flight demonstrator of the X-43 that I had the chance to work on. And it flew, and we learned a lot of interesting things from it. Um, but then I also worked on this vehicle called Venture Star. And this was another single stage to orbit, fully reusable from 96 to uh, 2001 X-33. And the disappointing thing of, of this program is that they required five miracles for this vehicle to fly. <laughs> So I thought, this is not a good trend, okay? <laughs> so, 
So when I sized this all up, and this was in the 90s, because it's actually really perplexed to me that what is going on, um, I've had a couple of missions at NASA where that I mean really sound engineering, and not that it's all sweetness and light, but generally, you know, um, you know, a credible plan and, and a viable approach. And then I had a couple of other programs that were just completely out of, you know, in left field. And then I realized, looking at it, that, hmm, let's look at what are the primary organizations sponsoring these programs. And NASA has three major slices, okay? We have human spaceflight, okay, that actually was part of the origin of the National Aerospace Plane and also Vention Star. We also have the Science Mission Directorate, and then we have the Aeronautics Mission Directorate. Those are our, our three big slices. I said, hmm, I think I see a pattern here. <laughs> that the, the Science Mission Directorate and the Aeronautics Mission Directorate, and I had other programs I worked on as well. Again, they aren't all sweetness and light, but they generally produced viable products and reasonable programs uh, for their budgets, and then human space flights was just way off the map. And so my conclusion in the late 1990s was that the NASA human space flight era was, area was severely compromised by special interests, just severely, to the point that making sound decisions was not an option, okay? It was, things were, were decisions were made to address various special interests operating on the program. So then my solution, was that the Science Mission Directorate and the Aeronautics Mission Directorate, um, they have powerful external communities that care about the products out of those missions. The Science Mission Directorate has the whole science community at universities and, and other places. The Aeronautics Mission Directorate has the aviation industry, so they kind of served as limiters to how much um, you know, special interest you know, manipulation can occur whereas human spaceflight did not. And so I came to the conclusion that we needed to stand up an influential external commercial spaceflight industry to serve as a limiter on the human spaceflight special interest, to provide some, okay, you can have some, you know, body English on this, but you can't be doing things that require multiple miracles. Okay, that's not a, a reasonable approach. Now, what I didn't know back then was that it was gonna take persistence and patience to make any progress on that. It actually took eight years before an opportunity presented itself where I can make any progress on this. And, and granted, this is a, a tall order. I mean, you're talking about a whole industry, you're talking about billions of dollars. Who am I to impact this whole industry? Well, you know, I had help, so. <laughs> but uh, let me take you back to one other thing that ties in. Uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, I was a, a young high school student when this movie came out. And me, along with a number of my colleagues, I have one of my colleagues, Bruce Pittman, here in the audience, we were really um, touched by this movie, and we actually expected this to happen, okay? We were looking for 2001, this was gonna happen. This came out in 1967, uh, 68, sorry, 68, <laughs> before the first landing on the moon, and we, you know, so then, this is followed by the moon landing, so we fully expected this to happen. And so when it didn't, okay, we thought, what can we do to change things? Well, it turns out we weren't alone. This guy, okay, did, turned out was apparently inspired by the same movie. In fact, if you read any of his history, you find that he was browsing the NASA website in 2001 to see what our plans were for putting humans on Mars. He couldn't find anything, okay? That disturbed him greatly. He came up with an idea of a Mars greenhouse that how do I get the public engaged? How do I get NASA really engaged in going to Mars? He's a master marketeer, okay? He had, it, uh, at this point in time, a, a non-trivial fortune from the success of PayPal. He had time on his hands. So he spent a lot of time working on his Mars greenhouse. In fact, I know from several colleagues that he put a, quite a bit of design time into it. He had this whole thing set up. And he thought showing that you could grow things on Mars would just be such a, uh, um, you know, a moving example of what can be done that would get the you know, people and, and NASA engaged. Well, all went fine until he went to uh, find prices for launching his greenhouse to Mars. And that's when he hit a wall. He found out the prices were just out of this world. Um, he looked both, uh, literally. <laughs> he, uh, he, he started in the U.S., and when he couldn't, um, 
find reasonable prices in the U.S., uh, he got directed to Russia uh, because they had converted ICBMs that they were they were selling, you know, at, at bargain basement prices. And so Elon went to Russia um, and uh, was not treated well there. Uh, the, there are stories. I was actually talking to a gentleman who went with him on this trip, and they told Elon, you know, when it comes to Russians, you know. Be careful what you say, okay? And it's hard to control Elon. So apparently, when they're in their discussions, at one point they ask, well, "Why should we think that you're a serious, you know, buyer of a Russian ICBM? You're a young man. How do you know? How do we know that you're serious about this? What money do you have to put behind this?" And before they could stop Elon, he went and told them kind of what his personal net worth was, and they said with something to the effect, "Well, usually this is forty million dollars, but for you, sixty million." And, <laughs> and apparently Elon stomped out of the room, and on his way home, on that long flight from Russia, is when he decided to do SpaceX. And what he did, he actually, he, he's a physicist and, econ and economist by training, so on the ride home, he actually did some analysis looking at why are these prices so high, and he knew for um, developed space trans or developed transportation systems, the ticket price is on the order of two to five times the fuel price. So you look at you know, you know, cars and aircraft and so on. And when he did the numbers for space transportation, again, they were way off the charts. How come these ticket prices are so much over the fuel prices? And he came to the conclusion there's mass inefficiencies in this market. And if he can't fix it as a buyer, he'll fix it as a supplier. And so he stands up SpaceX in 2002. Well, lo and behold, we come along the space portal, and this is in 2005, and this is actually our original charter, and this is myself, Bruce Pittman, and uh, three or four other colleagues at NASA Ames, and we each had interest in pursuing commercial space through some chance occurrences. We came together and started meeting. We realized we had common interests, we had some other people who helped us form an organization, get our own building, uh, give us resources to work together to, uh, to pursue uh, the development of, of uh, commercial space. And so our charter was to promote the commercial development space for NASA and public benefit. And I have to tell you, the public benefit side sticks with a lot of my colleagues. They wonder, is that our job? And we have to tell them, yes, that's our job. And we read the, the NASA Space Act Authority and public benefit is part of our job. Uh, we want to pursue economic intelligence and shared value creation through strategic partnerships. So this is public-private partnerships uh, with emerging space companies and organizations. And then we had our goals to promote the vision of the present Congress and NASA to establish a self-sustaining commercial space economy, infuse entrepreneurial practices into the civilian space program. So we want to back infect the, the things that NASA can do better from commercial space industry accelerate the development of the new space economy for public benefit, economic advancement, and exploration, catalyze mutually beneficial partnerships that leverage resources among NASA, industry, universities, nonprofits, and government, power, excuse me, pioneer and innovate developments and demonstration that open new markets and engage the public and inspire the next generation of space scientists, engineers, explorers, and entrepreneurs. And I have to say, even today when I read this, say, boy, this is a cool organization. And, uh, and I'm, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to be part of it. And the interesting thing is we wrote this charter in, essentially in 2005, and it has largely remained unchanged. It really is our constitution. Here's what we do. And we work with a lot of people. We work with a lot, you know, this is the advantage of being in Silicon Valley. Um, there's a lot of folks that we work SpaceX, but a lot of other ones. We've actually had uh, a couple nice, uh, startups, we had one company, Spire, here. Oops, excuse me. Spire uh, literally sprung from, from our premises. We had three students from International Space University that came to intern with us in the summer of 2012. And they came in the door, they said they had an idea for a space project for a commercial uh, small sat that they were going to use in kind of an education play and that they had a Kickstarter project that they wanted to do to do this, this, this spacecraft, and would that be okay that they did that for their internship? And we said, sure. 
what's Kickstarter? Okay, and they laughed. <laughs> <laughs> and once we, they told us what, what, what Kickstarter was, uh, we went forward. Um, and they did a 30-day Kickstarter project. They had their initial ask of $30,000. After 30 days, they had raised over $100,000. But even more importantly, they had garnered the attention of several VCs. They were quickly set up in an incubator in San Francisco with over a million dollar credit line. Today, uh, they recently closed a $50 million um, um, Series D, I think it was, funding round. They have 10 spacecraft uh, in space. They have operations in four countries. And that was three students the summer of 2012. So we're quite pleased about that. And as well as a lot of these other companies that we're working with. So it's Again, we're finding this is very fertile ground where you, you know, what does the government do? What does private industry do? What's the Venn diagram overlap? What can we do together? One of the very important things we did early on uh, was the Commercial Orbital Transportation Services Program. And this is a, a program that we pursued at NASA to really fill in for the decommissioning of the space shuttle. When the space shuttle was decommissioned, we have the International Space Station there. We've got to get logistics and crew to space station. Um, so the COTS program was stood up to assist when finding whether uh, emerging space providers could actually provide the, uh, the needed uh, lo logistics and eventually crew. Uh, we didn't quite get to crew. The program switched over what's called the commercial crew program. I'll get into that. But we did go through with the COTS program. And this is the program that actually funded Elon uh, to do his Falcon 9 development and his Dragon development. We also had an initial company that was funded. We had two, two awards called Rocket Plane Kistler. They actually fell out of this program. This was a milestone-based program. It had a very innovative uh, programmatic structure where the companies came in and proposed what milestones, technical milestones they would hit, and what, would, what was the finance, financial compensation they wanted for meeting that milestone. That's what they bid to us. We select the, you know what we thought were the most attractive offerings, and then the government gets to decide, gets to concur whether they've met the milestone or not. So it's, it's pay on delivery, okay? You make this milestone, you get paid. You don't make the milestone, you don't get paid. And we did that deliberately with actually the help of a, a VC who we had brought in, and who told us that the only way to balance the technical and financial risk is let the companies propose their own milestones because the government has no idea of how to balance those two things. So let the companies propose the technical steps and the financial compensation to balance their risks, and you get to pick the most attractive offerings. And that's what we did with COTS. Well, one of the other companies that we picked, which I had great doubt about, I must have <laughs> with Rockland and Kistler, and one of the reasons I had doubt about them, one of their early milestones is that they were going to raise $400 million in private capital, one of their early milestones, and this was 2007. Well, let's just say they needed a miracle, and that didn't happen. We pulled the plug on, on Rockland and Kistler. We had only spent uh, out of a a little under a $300 million award that they had, uh, $30 million, $34 million on milestones they had met. So we took the remaining cash, we re-competed um, uh, that, and that's where Orbital uh, ATK uh, got an award. But, and now today we have both SpaceX or Orbital ATK who send cargo and payloads to the ISS, and we had a follow-on program called Commercial Crew, which is working with both SpaceX and Boeing to provide crew transportation. But so this was a very, very successful program. We're very pleased with it. So let me tell you that what are the, we see are some of the really key success markers of the program. One, it provided critical support for SpaceX. In fact, um, Elon will tell you, because I've spoken with him about it, that without this program and the follow-on, the Commercial Resupply Services Program, SpaceX would have been a footnote. It would have been an Andy Beal. Who here knows and about the Andy Beal space program in the 90s? Huh? See, he was kind of like Elon, but he uh, didn't make as good of decisions, and so he went away. Andy Beal is the one who put all the facilities in Texas that Elon bought, you know, pennies on the dollar at McGregor. Uh, Andy Beal is the one who built all those. But anyhow, so it was critical to SpaceX. Um, it upgraded Orbital Science's launch capabilities. They had the Pegasus and the Taurus. Now they have the Antares, okay? So it allowed them to build another uh, orbital class and uh, one, you know, um, uh, rocket and one that has the capability to dock with station. 
Uh, number three is, is really important. We actually documented a factor of 10 cost savings for SpaceX compared to standard government contracting. And this was actually done by NASA headquarters. They actually wanted to know, okay, what's the cost savings? So we did it, we documented. And when we saw those numbers, we, we were all surprised. I mean, we knew that this was a good deal, but a factor of 10. And let's just say other people in the government have now, have, that's garnered their attention, okay? Now, obviously, you can't do this all the time, but it says, yes, this is possible. And then it also motivated other commercial space entrants, such as Blue Origin and ULA. And ULA is an interesting story. Um, so here, the current commercial space launch provider is now in 2017. We have a, a you know a nice ecology. Um, ULA is particularly interesting because they are a child of Boeing and Lockheed. They were actually stood up by uh, uh, Boeing and, and, and Lockheed as a wholly owned subsidiary to provide launch services out of the Cape. So they're a child of Boeing and Lockheed. They actually brought in a, recently a new CEO, Tori Bruno, who is now flipping the country from a traditional space company to new space. And that's actually a good indicator that this market is really going when you see incumbents flipping from the old model to the new model. And that's what ULA is doing, so we're very pleased. Um, Blue Origin, we had a chance actually, Bruce and myself and another colleague, to visit them uh, two weeks ago. And just let's just say they have big plans, okay? And Jeff Bezos being either the second or third richest man on the planet, and he is committed to put at least half of his fortune into Blue Origin, okay? And right now he's worth north of 75 billion, okay? And if you add that factor of 10 cost in a magnifier, okay, 750 billion worth of space development activity, that's a lot of money, that's a lot of development. So it, that's, it's going to be exciting going forward, and he has incredible plans with his new Glenn, his Blue Moon, uh, New Shepard, which is shown there, that's a suborbital. That's just the start of what he intends to do, and that's to build actually a base for uh, um, crew or um, space tourists, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, New Shepard is there to essentially provide as a feeder for space tourists who do a suborbital ride, and then onto an orbital ride with New Glenn, and eventually rides to the moon, which he has with his new Armstrong, which he's talking about. So he he thinks big, and a man who was in a uh, in the mid 90s when he began Amazon and it was him and 10 people in a van and I think his mom helping him and him driving things to the airport packages to the airport in his van to go from that to now being the third richest or second richest man on the planet in you know 20 years yeah this is a man to be reckoned with and so he has big plans ahead um, and so what were some of the lessons learned then so going through this and one of them is that it's essential to understand the relevant physics, and I'm going to expand on that a little bit, so let me just leave that for right the second. It's also really important to identify and join with like-minded individuals. You know, who, who shares your passion, who shares your view? Coming together, you can accomplish much more as a collaborative, you know, um, teamwork than you can individually. So that, that was key. Uh, plan and scan for opportunities to advance your interests. Like I said, I, I came up with my kind of strategy of standing up a commercial space industry um, to, you know, provide you know, limiters for human spaceflight, you know, back in the late 90s. It took patience before the, the opportunities finally presented themselves with the COTS program and other things to really make some progress on that. And then four, follow the three Ps, be prepared, persistent, and patient. And uh, the patient was the one I had the most trouble with, but I'm, I'm getting better at that. <laughs> okay, relevant physics. And this is something that I, I've run into a lot, and I'm kind of a, a physicist at heart, so I see things in terms of observables. Okay, if it's an observable, it's physics. Okay, so that means, <laughs> which is nice, because all these other disciplines are then different brands of, of physics. And so you have the physical physics, economic physics, and social physics. And the one that I found that most people stumble over, and particularly engineers, are the, the social physics. Essentially, how do humans interact, behave, and make decisions, okay, in a broad sense. Now, po politics is part of this, sociology is part of this, psychology is part of this. I kind of group those all under social physics. So I want to lay out a couple important social physics, particularly um, when you're dealing with bureaucracies. And when you're dealing with bureaucracies, you have two social physics conditions that you really have to be aware of 
and look for ways to counter. And one of them is cognitive confirmation, and one of them, the other one is cognitive culture. Now, cognitive confirmation, confirmation bias, we all have this, okay? Um, some have it more than others, but we all have confirmation bias. That is that our belief system gives us filters on what we will hear or see. So when you are presented information, you don't just take it ad hoc. You put filters on it. Things that agree with your perceptions, you tend to magnify. Things that disagree with your perceptions, you tend to ignore, okay? And everyone has this, okay? And it's, so it's something that we have to work with. The number two is even harder and more difficult to confront, and it's cognitive culture, and that's the wanting to believe. And that's the case that where you have a group that you want to be part of, and they have a certain belief set, and for you to be part of that group, you have to adopt that belief set. Thank you for smoking. You know, if you take a look, if you're in the tobacco industry, uh, you know, smoking's good for you. You'll find people that will completely abandon what you might think is rational thought and, and adopt belief sets because that's what they need to believe to be part of a group. And this is really important when you have bureaucracies and particularly when you have entrenched interests because the people pursuing those interests they can rationalize everything they're doing, and they can be largely, you know, um, you know, completely, you know, Bolivia or um, unhear uncaring and unhearing to anything you have to say. You know, they, they, it just doesn't get through because it threatens their membership in the group that they want to be part of. And I, I've seen this a lot. I've come across this a lot at NASA. Okay, and that's where I, I point this out. So how do you handle the first one? The, the, you counter uh, confirmation bias with diversity. And if you have never read this book, okay, I highly recommend it. In fact, anyone who wants to understand why democracies work, this, this tells you why. And uh, essentially, it goes into wisdom of crowds, which is the opposite of foolishness of crowds, okay? And that the way you, that way you defeat confirmation bias is you need diversity of perspectives. And so diversity isn't a burden, it's actually a benefit, okay? And that to really understand difficult problems, you need lots of different perspectives. You need all views of the elephant, not just one side. That means you have to be willing to listen to people that you, that you, you know, uh, disagree with, you know, mightily, okay? Not that you buy their view, but at least listen to them. And so, diversity. And the key concept then is did, and this is one thing I've really watched for at NASA, and called the power of did, okay? Did is diverse, independent, and decentralized. If you have those conditions, you get wisdom of crowds. You get good answers, you get, you know, good ways of, of, of moving forward. Um, the opposite of did, which pretty much describes many bureaucracies, okay, where they're, you know, homogeneous, interdependent, and centralized. Does that sound familiar? Okay, that tends to get you to this other side where you have really skewed perspectives and come up with really bad answers, and there's lots and lots of examples of that. So that's one thing that I've watched for. Um, in my NASA, you know, um, experience, I can tell you Still today, okay, but much, much worse years ago, you'd walk into a room and it would look like, you know, something that came out of a, a cookie cutter, okay, the people in the room, you know, white males of a certain age and so on for the most part, and, and I'm a white male of the, that age too, but I remember being struck like, wow, this is really, it doesn't look like this group here, I'll tell you, <laughs> it looks much, much different. And that, that leads to, to difficulties. And they're, they're trying to, you know, NASA and other bureaucracies try to get more diversity, but uh, it's a difficult thing to, to accomplish. Now for the second one, which is a harder problem, you know, my experience, you really need to go to disruptors. And that, that's become quite a, I think, a popular term. But let me just give you some background if you haven't seen this. You've absolutely got to read Clayton Christensen's The In Innovator's Dilemma. Because, and this is, by the way, I found to say, that's it. I mean, you're struggling with this. That's what a disruptor is. And it's the whole idea of that, develop, I call them developments, because these can be technologies or they can be processes or so on. So I broaden from technologies to, to, uh, to just calling them developments. That you have two key you know, categories. You have ones that sustain existing value chains. And then you have ones that disrupt existing value chains. And that was the thing that he really first identified. And then second, identified what are the aspects of disruptive developments. And this is really important and it's not uh, you know, intuitive at all. Disruptive developments are initially underperforming, okay? 
but technologies or capabilities that have inherent advantages. So even though they're initially underperforming, they have inherent advantages. If they can find niche markets and execute product cycles, that's absolutely essential. They eventually overtake and overwhelm incumbents. And there's lots of examples. He gives lots of examples in his book. But it's counterintuitive to what you think. Most bureaucracies, um, they don't recognize disruptive technologies They're usually or capabilities. It's usually something they try to expunge from the organization. Okay, they try to get rid of it because it doesn't fit with their business model. And that goes back to this whole thing that, you know, um, um, Xeroxes actually were an invention that came from Kodak. Well, of course, but the, the engineers who came up with this process, they couldn't sell it to their management because who wants low grade photo reproduction? Well, apparently everyone, but to the people at Kodak, they didn't see that. The same way for electronic watches. Where, where is the invention of the electronic watch from? Swiss watch engineers, okay? But guess what? Their management thought, oh, hold it, this isn't a watch. It doesn't have a mainspring. No, no, no. So they had to go you know, over and sell it to, to, uh, to the Japanese, to, uh, to Sharp. Uh, or, or, and uh, uh, it was an electronics company that this, they knew electronics, and so this is a new product for electronics. So you see that over and over again where a disruptive innovation is actually you know, pushed out of an organization and that springs up. So I have a question for you then. This is SpaceX circa 2008. Underperforming? Absolutely. Okay, in 2000, I'll tell you right now, you know, we were laughed at. Why are you supporting those guys? You know, they'll never amount to anything. You know, they're on this funny island out in the Pacific. You know, yeah, Elon eventually will, you know, spend his fortune and move on to lying on beaches. You know, you're wasting your time. Okay. Here we are today, Falcon 9 Block 5 coming up is an incumbent killer, okay? No one on the planet right now can compete with Elon's capabilities with his Falcon 9 Block 5. And so that was the product cycles that he went through that we had to hand in. And his Dragon capsule, which we're pleased with. And now, of course, he has rolled out his vision, make humans a multi-planetary species. I mean, he's not done. And now he has these systems, you know, in play. He wants to do his Dragon 2 and his, I think he's still calling it his ITS, his interplanetary uh, transport system, which is just this fully reusable two-stage to orbit, 450 metric tons to LEO. I mean, this is just gargantuan. This would just blow everything out of the water if you can pull this off. But he's not alone, okay? We also have ULA. Remember I was talking about ULA? This is the stodgy child uh, Boeing and Lockheed, okay? So Boeing and Lockheed Child, this is their vision for Cis Lunar 1000, okay? That they've rolled out. And so you can see what they're looking at here. They, they have what, where things are today. Oops, sorry. They have where things are today, and then they have in five years where they see things will be as far as market activity, and then 15, and then 30. And they see things growing dramatically. And again, this is what you would consider a very, you know, button-down organization. They also have a really interesting development called the Advanced Cryogenic Evolved Stage, which could be revolutionary for upper stages. It gives you what's called indefinite life upper stages. Now we're getting kind of into the details of rocketry, but that's a big deal. And essentially, it's a race car engine on a spacecraft. You know, what could, how cool is that? Okay, so anyhow. <laughs> but it's a really good idea. Oh, and then we got Jeff Bezos. Okay, millions of people living and working, and he's in space. Oh, and then Earth zoned for habitation and light industry. That, and that's Jeff's vision. So if you want to do anything outside of habitation and light industry, you got to do it off planet, okay? So <laughs> and he's absolutely, you know, um, serious about this. And he's been working on it since he was in high school. And now he has the fortune to do it. And one of the things that we found out recently is that this is actually a study uh, from um, a summer study that uh, we did at NASA Ames back in the 70s. And uh, apparently this work was one of the things that inspired Jeff, this whole idea of human you know, you know, colonies and so on off planet, that how cool that, you know, it might be the planet isn't a cool place to be. Maybe there are cooler places to be than planets inside of asteroids and so on. And so that's what spun up his imagination, and now that's his new gland over here. 
by the way, that's rocketry, 44 metric tons to LEO, fully reusable first stage. Again, that's just, just kills anything that currently operates today. Just so you know where these guys are going. It's not like making a small change. They are making these huge changes. And then we've seen something even on the power side. We came across this, okay, so I'm not sure how effective this is yet or influential per in your industry, but at least there's some big minds thinking about breakthrough energy. And uh, so this wave, you know, of how do we do things in a new way, I think is, is starting to continue to go. Until then, I'm going to have some time for questions, so let me give you my last slide. I really like this quote from Darwin, and I, I think it really tells the story. It's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent. It's the one that is most adaptable to change. Okay, it's adapt or die. And uh, the people who adapt well, uh, succeed well. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing your vision. I was wondering, you said you were inspired back in the 1970s or in 2017 now. Do you still think it's the most urgent problem to kind of build a holiday home that needs a giant magnetic shield while your family home is burning? <laughs> I th the way we look at it is that uh, um, if you can open the solar system to you know, resources, if, we, if the resources of the solar system are at our disposal, we can do much more here on planet Earth to do just what Jeff Bezos wants to do, okay? You know, um, zone Earth for habitation and light industry, okay? So we can keep this really a much nicer place to be than trying to do a lot of things on Earth. Um, you, know, you know, coal mines and, and, and uh, mining for, for rare earth metals and, and a lot of the other things. Um, one of the things that I find, you know, troubling is this whole idea of mining the, the seabeds. Well, how much damage is that going to do to the seas? Or what if you can get these precious minerals off planet where you're not impacting our, 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 you know, our fragile ecology? So that's how we see it. If we, we have more options to get the resources we need to live, we have many better ways to go forward than if we do if we're constrained. <coughs> Hi, so for those of us who might be thinking about a career in space exploration and all those things, what questions should we be asking ourselves, I guess, as college students or people pursuing advanced degrees? I think I would ask what really, you know, um, excites you? Where do you have your passion? And that's one of the things I've seen over and over again. Those, those three ISU students that came, I thought that was just wonderful. You know, they really wanted to do this small spacecraft. They had, knew about Arduinos and so on. Now it's interesting, they had the, the wrong idea and we knew it. We tried to steer them off of it, but they were, you know, they were adamant they wanted to do it, but they pivoted, okay? And the whole thing, small business, as anyone here knows, what's critical isn't necessarily so much your idea, it's getting started and then being able to pivot that when you find out your initial idea isn't gonna work, well, what will? And, but it was their passion that brought them together. By the way, they also found like-minded individuals. There were five of them. They came together, they shared the same vision, and now they have a you know, $50 million plus business and, and, and uh, have lots of prospects. But it really comes down to what are you passionate about, and then how does that fit given the opportunities that you see that are available? Hi, thanks for your time. Do you see the space economy being driven more by space tourism or by mining? I think that's a really good question, and I think I'd say right now smart money is on Jeff Bezos. And uh, Jeff appears from the pieces we can put together, he thinks it's actually going to be on human presence off planet, which by the way surprises a lot of people. And if you try to do any market projections right now, it's like, well, how many people are willing to do that? Well, Elon's found two are willing to pay him probably at least $100 million to fly around the moon. But it looks like Jeff feels there's enough of a potential market there. That's, it, it's clear his whole business line is set up on that. But that's a question we're going to find out. It's clearly one potential market. One of the things I like about the, particularly like about the scarce resources, we've seen through history, um, resource scarcity leads to wars. Okay, that's, you know, that's a foundation for war. And so if you can avoid wars, you know, and get resources from off planet, okay, that would be tremendously beneficial. And so I think that might be a big driver. 
um, but we'll see. Uh, we are looking right now at markets in microgravity for both laboratories and new products that looks like they could just uh, revolutionize a number of different areas. Uh, when you remove gravity, it turns out it gives you a whole new view into physics, okay? And so uh, that's also a burgeoning area. Hi, do you have any advice on how a college student can get their foot in the door into the space exploration industry? It's not like computer science or something else where the barrier to entry is small. There are internships, I know that. I, SpaceX does a lot of internships. That's a really good way to get in. Um, that would be one way that I would look. Uh, professional societies, AIAA, the New Space, uh, New Space Frontiers Foundation. Uh, so professional societies and internships is what I would suggest because it gives you a chance to see what's there, make contacts, and then you know, find your way into uh, to job opportunities. Hi, thank you. Uh, I have a plug. It's uh, for the campus, Ham Radio. And last month we successfully launched and recovered a high altitude balloon. And so I think that's a, a good activity if anyone's interested. We work with the Supernode uh, in uh, Corey Hall. It's, uh, so if, <clears throat> the group is supernode-ham at berkeley.edu. Very good. No, I mean, and it turns out a lot of the things you're doing, particularly high altitude balloons, um, are very applicable to space. We actually had a, a, a mission that we ran, it's called the Reentry Breakup Recorder, and we did actually some balloon qualifications and found some problems with the design, because when you take things to very high altitude, very low pressure, uh, they can work differently. So yeah, it's a, actually a nice entryway, low cost, low risk, to get at least your hands you know, dirty with uh, space-like hardware. Sorry. Uh, so a lot of U.S. companies before SpaceX were using Russian engines. Uh, do you attribute any of SpaceX's success to the fact that they developed their own engine? Um, and did that affect your decision uh, as a government organization when deciding who to give money to? Actually, it did impact the designs or the award selection for COTS. We actually had one proposal that was actually looking at using Russian hardware uh, being configured and being produced in the U.S. Uh, to be a, a provider of logistics support to the ISS, and it actually was not selected in part because of the concerns about you know the Russian dependence. And right now, the the Atlas V uses the RD-180. Um, it's the you know the only one now that's using uh, a Russian engine. And um, th turns out Blue Origin is developing a replacement for that. It's called the BE-4. And it looks like that will be the replacement engine for the Russian RD-180. So yes, I, um, Elon has been very adamant about US workforce, OK? And the people he hires are all US, same way at Tesla. And uh, so he, uh, he's a big believer in, in US manufacturing, which of course has endeared him to the current administration. So he's, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, um, yeah, the, the Russian connection is, particularly for space and things that have national security implications, that's always problematic. Uh, hi. Okay. So we see a lot of tech being developed for uh, taking people to space, but do you have any insight on any technology being developed to monitor human health in space or on these space travels? There, there are a few things. Um, there's an organization called CASIS, Center for Advancement of Science in Space CASIS. They have calls for developments um, that you can do in space. Um, it's too small right now compared to, I think, what the need is and really NASA's interest in commercializing both LEO and the International Space Station. So stay tuned. There are calls that come out quite frequently. Quite, quite frequently. That's one thing that NASA, I think, does quite well, calls for different technologies, announcements of opportunities, and so on. And so keep your eyes open for things in, in that area. Hi. Uh, so like in the new congressional bill uh, for like where NASA should spend their money, they mentioned that like in 50 years they want to do the uh, interstellar mission, and so I was wondering if like you have any like internal like conversation about actually like setting up some calls or some funding for that like interstellar mission. Like in the call in like the in the thing it references like the Phil Lubin's research work on like using lasers to send uh, small spacecrafts, but I don't know like what are you guys talking about at NASA right now about? <laughs> Um, there, we do have a called the NIAC, the uh, NASA Innovative uh, Advanced Concepts, that looks at far out concepts such as that. 
Um, I mean, they're not large dollar, dollar value typically, but there is some activity. Um, that's out there. Um, I think that you know someday, if, if we're successful with where we're at now, we, we may accomplish that. I have joked with some of my colleagues, you know, we'll, you know, warp drive, that's what we need to develop on the moon. Okay, so anyhow, so with <laughs> so looking forward, and, uh, uh, but that's a long ways off. Interstellar is really tough. I mean, right now, they, what's, the, what's the deepest mission right now? Is it Voyager, Bruce? Is it, or? Yeah, probably Voyager for the south. Yeah, so we, we do have spacecraft that are out in actually intergalactic space, but it, it, that's still a really, Big problem, but we do have people working on that. Our former center director actually was a big believer in interstellar travel, Pete Warden, and so he was pushing that. Um, he, I think, probably pushed it a little too hard, and so people thought, "No, that's okay. That's we can we can look at that, but not to put too much money behind it yet." So uh, that that's pretty far out there. Hi, uh, thanks for speaking. Um, this is a different sort of question, uh, but what are your views on the potential like socioeconomic separations and distinctions that would come about from space colonization? For example, the difference between um, so the coloniz colonization of Mars versus the gentrification of Mars, just due to access to, just due to the access of wealth to of people. Well, it, well, and there's a number of, of I think social implications. I mean, if you have a colony, you know, off planet, what will be their organizational model? I mean, they're one of the things that you know opening new frontiers does, and it gives you a chance to try things that you can't try in your homeland. And you, you look through history. The people who came to, I don't know, the United States were the kind of the, the wanderers who didn't want to stay in the old country, okay? And I happen to know this because my wife actually is from France, and, and a lot of her family could never believe, why would you want to come to the U.S.? I mean, and so that, that whole idea of having a frontier where you can kind of make your new set of rules and try, new, try different things, I think is actually an important part of human evolution, if you want my opinion. And I think that's another reason why we need to open this door, because we'll see how humans evolve off planet. And it may take some surprising directions that we can't even guess at right now. Um, yeah, I have a quick question regarding kind of off the Mars colonization thing. Um, what do you think, you mentioned earlier nuclear energy, what do you think nuclear energy's role is in the space exploration and the colonization of Mars? It's going to be critical. In fact, I happen to know Elon's looking seriously at uh, nuclear uh, surface power. Very quickly when you get past Earth, okay, even if you're trying to do solar photaic, you don't have enough, okay, the, the, the intensity of sun. And also you have things like even on the moon, you have something called the lunar night when the sun doesn't shine, when it gets down to about 50 degrees Kelvin, okay, this is really cold. And so you have to have ways that you can stay alive when the sun isn't shining or when the sh sun's too weak. Right now the only, you know, alternative that we know of is nuclear. And that's one of the reasons why we think, you know, we call it sustainable nuclear, that we think sustainable nuclear is really important, not, I think, just for Earth, but also for exploration and moving beyond. Now, maybe someday we'll discover something beyond nuclear, but right now nuclear is really the next step above, you know, combustion, which is right now what space uses, rocket, you know, rocketry is combustion, okay, it's chemical energy. And I think it's just a matter of time when, okay, humans need to really master nuclear energy to actually be able to do the things we want to do. And so I think this is a step in the right direction. And I think space can provide a good motivator for that because you're so constrained. There's no hydrocarbons, okay, and you're very constrained in most places. And you're very constrained even with solar. And so you need to have a, a nuclear alternative. So you mentioned that um, uh, SpaceX managed to reduce cost by a factor of 10. Um, but you don't mention specifically what the cost drivers were that there's increased. a report actually i can send that i can send that to to per okay. because there's actually a nasa report they they go through and show um, a lot of it had to do with uh, supply chain control so in other words the cost and it was one of the reasons that drove elon um, from doing okay elon originally intended spacex to be a system integration house and getting components from aerospace providers and he found that he, his costs went through the roof if he did that in his schedules. And that's why he went to more vertical integration where he could control his supply chain all the way down to the component level where you have multiple providers so you get good deals. Mm -hmm. So that was a big part of it was supply chain control. So because of time constraints, we're going to do one last question okay. here, and then we're going to impose on Dan to maybe chat with our folks uh, out at the reception a little <laughs> okay. bit longer. So if you didn't get your question in here, you can have a private question with Dan at the re or 
an open question at the reception. <laughs> an open question. <laughs> Hi, um, so you had mentioned a lot about uh, potentially mining things from different planets. I was wondering if right. NASA is already thinking about any ethical implications of taking resources from other areas of the universe. And not so much ethical, but um, legal and political. I don't know if you know, but it turns out that space law is wide open, okay? There are, uh, we actually had, a, had an expert uh, from uh, Austria, an expert in space law. And right now, it's pretty much the Wild West. When you get above our atmosphere, you know, it's what, anything goes. Whatever you, whatever you want to do, you can do if someone can't stop you. And that's one of the things that there's concerns about actually putting international agreements and policies in place that won't lead to difficulties downstream. And so it's, so they haven't even, we haven't even touched ethics yet. I mean, this just to the legalities of what can be there and that really needs to be put to bed and that's an area of considerable concern. So anyhow, Dan, I, I wanna thank you. It's been a fantastic <laughs> afternoon Sorry. and the discussions we've had uh, during today and, and during this talk are absolutely wonderful. I think it's time for us to thank thank Dan for just a fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.